Thank you folks for coming. Uh, you know, Paul Boslin, absolutely, for all of us that have been in college more than a couple of years, needs no introduction to me. He's one of those consummate professors that all of us that were colleagues with him uh, are in admiration of him because he's just one of those scholars that uh, not only uh, gets the job done, but just has the personality that uh, makes you want to spend time with him, not just as a scholar, but as a friend. And, and he truly is a friend of the college. And uh, Mr. Tillett, Paul Boslin. Paul. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see so many friends here. It's, um, I expected maybe uh, six people would get up to come and hear me this morning, so it's great to see you all. Um, in one week from today, I have a significant uh, milestone that I will reach. I will have been here 25 years a week from today. So I may be sitting out there next year listening to the speaker. <laughs> we'll see how things go uh, uh, from Santa Fe. Well, what I was going to do today is, is talk a little bit about um, my program and, and what we did. It's, it was kind of a, a kind of a year in review that I, that I put together, and um, maybe you'll find it interesting, I hope. Um, one of the things we did last year is we had the International Pepper Conference here in September. Uh, this rotates around the United States. Uh, we hosted it. Javier and I did it 16 years ago. And so I, I said, okay, we can do it one more time. And then I'm not going to be here, I know, in 16 years, so I won't worry about it. So we had people from all over the world come, and we had a, a nice garden demonstration garden of chilies from around the world and Campbell's soup, paste, um, Campbell's own paste salsa. And it turns out that one of my students is their tomato breeder and one is a pepper breeder. So if you buy a bottle of uh, paste salsa, you're helping my graduate stu my students. So they underwrote the garden. And then we started, um, gosh, maybe five years ago? Two years ago, just two years ago, Holy Jalokia. And um, one of our friends with the Chile Institute, John Hard, said, I'd like to do something for you to do a fundraiser. And Mark Gladden got with him and said, what we really want to do is endow a chair in Chile Research so that when I do retire, that they won't eat the positions, that we'll always have someone here since Fabian Garcia into the future to work on chilies. And so we've been doing um, an endowment to, to uh, endow a chair in Chile Research. And John stepped forward and said, well, I'll make you a um, hot sauce out of Bucciolokia, the world's hottest chili pepper. And so that was a great success. He then made us a salsa, and so that was a very big success. And this May, we're going to release or announce our new Holy Jalokia barbecue sauce for the summer season. So something to look forward to. Uh, these are all formulated by John. And what I told John is really, we, we don't need it really, really hot. And as we say, melt your face off heat. What we want is flavor, so they have very nice flavor. I've tried this one, it is kind of hot, but I, but I have a cute story. Um, a fella came into to the institute and wanted a case of the salsa. And I said, oh, you, you must really uh, love this salsa. And he says, no, it's a little too hot for me. And I said, but why are you buying a case of it? He says, it's for my sons-in-law and my snotty-nosed nephews. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> So there is another use for this product if it's a little too hot for you. I actually brought some today, if you, and they're, they're $10 a bottle. I don't have any barbecue sauce, but I did bring some hot sauce and salsa. If you have a snotty-nosed nephew, you need to take some back, too. Th then, then you may have heard about our Heritage 6.4. Uh, about 10 years ago, the chili growers told us that, you know what's happening? We're getting really good yields with our chilies, but we don't have any flavor. You've lost the flavor of New Mexico chilies. So we went back, actually got seed of the original New X64, Big Jim, Sandia, and began to make selections again to try to get back to a chili that growers would grow, that would have good yield, good cultural, horticultural, agronomic traits that a farmer could grow, but also that flavor. And so we released New Mex, uh, Heritage 64, and Chris Byad uh, came forward with, um, um, we started a f a freezing the green chilies, and so, he, he donates what we call Biad's Reserve to the, to the Chile Institute, and those proceeds go to the endowed chair. So this um, fall, you'll be able to again get uh, Biad's Reserve, which is uh, the hand-picked green chilies, Heritage 6-4 or Big Jim, that has uh, been frozen into one-pound packets and hand-picked in a sense. Also, we, we, we continually do ornamentals. Ornamentals is kind of a busman's holiday for me and my students. It's always fun to, to work with it. It is um, 
an important pro part of the program because it gets a lot of national attention, but it's also kind of fun with a different color. So we released five new ones, uh, making now a total of uh, 10 ornamentals that, that we have available. Um, mentioned New Mex Heritage Big Jim. We had New Mex Heritage 6.4, and then we released New Mex Heritage Big Jim uh, this past year. Um, we, one of the problems with New, uh, Big Jim is that it had variable heat. When you get Big Jim, you never know how hot the pod's going to be. So I used to tell people, oh, well, you know, it's traditional in New Mexico. We have this thing is everybody makes a chili relleno. We all take a bite. And if mine's too hot and yours too mild, we just trade. That's because we get along so well. And, and so, but we knew that that wasn't going to last forever. And so what we had to do is go out and you make a uniform heat on Big Jim. So we had a decision to make. Well, what heat level would we choose? So what we chose was kind of a high heat level. 7,000 Scoville heat units is kind of like a sandia because we already had New Mex Joey Parker, which is very mild. If you eat chili in New Mexico, it probably has no heat to you, but people back east love it. Then we released New Mex Heritage 6.4, which is medium heat, about 1,500. So we decided to go with a hot big gym. So this is kind of a hot line, 7,000 Scoville heat units. We will, through time, release a medium and a mild big gym. But first we wanted to do, uh, have kind of a mild, medium, and hot in, in, uh, ready already for, for people to choose from. Uh, Hal Mundo was a, uh, a chili. It's, it's, it's a new kind of jalapeno. It's a big one. If you've noticed in the grocery stores over the last decade, jalapenos keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the consumer wants it. They want really gigantic um, uh, jalapenos. So we released this, and, I, and, I, and when I wrote up the article, I explained what a popper was. We all know what poppers are, but lots of people don't. And so I explained that this was going to be a, a popper, and the AP wire service picked it up, uh, and, it, and we really got a lot of press, and I just did an interview a few weeks ago with the Food Network magazine. They're going to run a story about this. But one guy said, you know, I don't know if we need to be supersizing poppers. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, it's all right. Um, again, it's about uh, 17,000 Scoville heat units, which is normal for a jalapeno, and it yields about 20,000 pounds per acre. Um, also released our first Phytophthora wilt-resistant um, jalapeno, New Mex Vaquero. This, this um, I always like to tell my students the story. When I first interviewed here, they were asking me about chili wilt. And I said, oh, chili wilt, no problem, because uh, I read in the literature, if you have a single allele at either of two loci, you have resistance. And in plant breeding, that's just a simple back cross. Three to four years, I'll have your resistant variety. So they hired me. <laughs> And, and, it, and I just released the first Phytophthora resistant chili. So either I'm a very bad plant breeder or there was much more to the story than the literature said, and it was that. We found out that there were different disease syndromes. Uh, there are different races. And so we had to incorporate all that into the breeding. But now that we know this, we're making very good progress. And so I tell people, you have to think global, but breed local for Phytophthora uh, resistance. Also, we released New Mex Las Cruces, a Cayenne, high yielding. The interesting thing about this is, and this is how serendipity works in research. We were trying to breed a high yielding, open pollinated variety. Right now, the variety they like to grow is called Mesilla, and it's an F1 hybrid, and a pound of seed costs $2,800. Open pollinated seeds, about 100 bucks. So the, the, the uh, there's only two families, Cervantes and, and Arturo Jurado, really are interested in Cayennes, but they said we need an open pollinated variety because we direct seed, transplants are, uh, we have to transplant the hybrids, it adds costs, could you work on it? So that's where we were headed. But one year we had severe curly top in the field at Leindecker, the, at our research farm, and we noticed one line didn't have disease. It, it was resistant out there. So we went back, started selecting into that line, and pretty soon we had New Mex Las Cruces, which has resistance to the curly top virus. So it's the very first pepper of any type with curly top resistance. So we're very proud of that one. Cayennes have, have, have to be very hot, and this one's very hot. Wanted to talk a little bit about what, in my program, I get to stand up here and talk about it, but it's really the students that do the work. And so one of the students I have now is working on, on Phytophthora, trying to get a better handle on some of the, the um, aspects of the disease. Uh, Adriana's from Colombia. She's working on her PhD, actually just passed her defense last week. 
But one of the things we knew is that we had many races of, of, of this um, pathogen, this fungus that attacks chili. So what we wanted to do, what we'd have to do is inoculate the plants if they, if they were resistant, then get another race, inoculate. And so this would take months to do. What we were trying to figure out, could we do something much faster? And what she came up with, whoops, got to go back, uh, as a way to put the inoculum, and, and I don't know, if you probably not be able to read it back there, but this is race one, and you can see the leaf is dying. This is race two, it's resistant. And then this is distilled water, which is a control. So, so what we're able to do now is put up to five, six races on one seedling to see if it's resistant or not. So we can speed up the breeding program much faster. Okay. Turns out that that article also was the, one of the top 10 red articles in that journal for the year. So it was, a lot of people found that very interesting. Also, I'll talk to you a little bit at the end about our summer program called Assured. We work with children from migrant farm workers. And um, again, Javier comes every year to talk to these kids and tell them, you will never pick chilies or onions in the field if you get the education in this college. And so what we hope to do is that they will get their education, stay in school, and, and, and be successful. Well, Maribel was one of the students in the program, and she and I worked on a problem, a gro grafting chilies. Uh, Nowadays in the, in the industry, when you grow chilies in greenhouses, they are usually grafted, or if you grow tomatoes, they are grafted. And if you're an organic farmer and want to grow heirloom tomatoes, which don't have much resistance, you graft them on a resistant tomato rootstock. So you buy the F1 hybrid that has all the resistance, you graft the heirloom on top, and you get better yield. So what we were looking at is could we graft chilies onto tomatoes? And that was her project. And what the pictures show that, yes, you can. And so uh, she was very successful. And then there's a journal out there called the Journal of Young Investigators for Students. It's student peer reviewed, it's student published. Uh, professors, advisors help with it. I, I help um, with the journal, but it's really kind of for the students to get their first publication. So as an undergraduate, she has already gotten her first publication. So we're very, very proud of her. She'll be graduating in May from Family and Consumer Sciences and uh, in um, fashion. So. We hope that uh, maybe she should, should go on to graduate school. Also, uh, a year ago uh, this spring, I took sabbatic uh, leave. And I originally planned to go to South America. But, but while I was planning my sabbatic, an opportunity came for me to come go to China. I was invited to come go to the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, visit the scientists there. And I said, well, if I come, I'd like to see something about chili production. I, uh, I don't really want to just stay in the lab. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll arrange a, a trip. And so the, the two professors that I was with was Dr. Wang and Dr. Liao. Dr. Liao is a very interesting fellow. He w went through the um, Great Leap Forward in China, and he almost starved to death. He said, you know, um, it's funny, um, Mao Zedong is like George Washington. He never did anything wrong. People just misinterpreted him. And so he said, you know, I, I had to eat bark off trees. I had to, I almost starved to death because the army came in and took all our food away for this great leap forward. But he says, now today in China, we are in the great leap forward. This is what Mao Zedong really wanted. And I must tell you, they are a communist country politically, but you have never seen so much capitalism in your life. Everybody has a business, everybody. And uh, I'll show you one of their interesting uh, businesses here. In we went to nor uh, uh, kind of um, north east China, and Beijing is 15 million people, so they have a lot. They have a lot of need for consumption of of, of fruits and vegetables, and their 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 economy is growing. Their their capital their uh, cash. Uh, Flow is good, so they would like interesting colored bell peppers. They've got a, a, a taste now for colored bell peppers. And so we travel to, to this region, and you can see it, it is um, a little bit of rural, but this is the wall to their greenhouse. And this is the inside of it. So you can see this is the big dirt, this is the wall, and there's a plastic hoop coming over here, and these are the chilies. What, what the way that this works is they have no artificial heating. What the, they're just letting the sun heat it up. And what this wall of soil faces south. So during the day, it absorbs heat and then radiates heat back into the greenhouse at night to keep the chilies warm. When I was there the night, it dropped to 32 degrees. 
And inside the greenhouse, it never went below 55, which is important. That's what uh, peppers need not to lose fruit. So it works very, very well. So kind of a low input technology, but it works very, very well for them. And then if, if they know that it's going to get kind of uh, cold for the next few days, they'll roll down these straw mats over the roof, kind of like a blanket to kind of keep the heat in and, and hold, it, hold it, um, the chilies in kind of a, uh, a, a holding state till, till, till it warms up again and they'll roll it back off. But in China, they waste no space. And at every greenhouse, so this is the uh, um, door to come in. And when you come in, there's somebody who lives here at the greenhouse. This is their home. They live in here. And then on this side, if, you were, if we were to stand here and look out, th this is the hole to go into where you saw the, 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 the chilies being grown. So you kind of go down a little tunnel to get in the greenhouse. But this is kind of the caretaker and their home. And, and they watch over the greenhouse. And I was asking them, um, they seem very popular. They're building more and more of them all in this area. There's just a constant growth of this. And it's a whole growth industry. Turns out the European and the American seed companies are in there now selling their varieties. And I said, well, how much do they make growing these chilies? And, and it turns out to be $5,000 a year. And to them, this is excellent, significant income. And that's why they want to do this. So they're making about $5,000 a year. And so just incredible expansion on these, these um, low input greenhouses, but high input. And China also lets agricultural products ship for free. You don't pay any uh, road taxes on trucks that do agricultural products. You don't pay any tolls on the highways. So from that region, every day, semis of these red and yellow bell peppers are going into Beijing to be consumed. And one of the things they wanted me to do is explain to the, the government people that I saw at the um, Academy of Science were told, you now must make varieties and sell them and make money. So here's a communist country saying, you as a government employee has to become a capitalist. So um, they were saying, how do we make an orange F1 hybrid? And that's what I showed them. I showed them how to do it, how they could get one quickly. And so in, in a sense, uh, hopefully we'll see a, a, uh, an orange bell pepper shortly going into Beijing. Next slide. So, so what do we have planned for this year? Um, we're hoping to release the New Mex Heritage Sandia. Um, Sandia originally was a red chili variety. You would grow it for red powder. So it has a very thin wall. It's not very good green chili. And people have complained about this for a long time that when, when they get it for, as a green chili, it's too thin. So we've made the decision to, to select for a thicker green wall. So it's now going to become a green chili variety. And red chili dehydrators could de dehydrate if they want. And, but really, it's going to become now a green variety. Our assured program, again, this summer, we, we will get 10 students from uh, families from migrant farm workers. I have a cute story to tell you there. Um, Stephanie Walker was in Hatch looking at some onion fields. And uh, the workers were out there picking some onions or something, and, and she introduced herself and said, I'm from the university. And they said, oh, you run the Assured program. So even the workers out there know about the program because from their children talking about coming down. So we'll have 10 more students. And many of the faculty uh, in the college uh, helped me out on this because each student is put with a faculty member to, to learn about science, agricultural science. And we've had a pretty good success rate. About 40% of the students convert to a, to a, a major in the College of Ag. They all come in with two ma uh, ma basically two majors. This is cute. They're either in education or in criminal justice. And do you know why? The two mentors are teachers and the Border Patrol agent. So that's where they're tracked. I want to be a Border Patrol agent or a teacher. And we say, no, nah, come and be a scientist. It's more fun. The endowed chair, with Mark's great help, we are making super, super progress. We are, we are at about 340000 $341,000 towards the million dollars for the chair. And without Mark's great help, we would not be anywhere near that. He has just been super. I'm not a very good salesperson. I'll give you everything anytime you want it. But he's been good to say, no, you don't get it unless you put some money on the table. So that's what I need. So, so Mark's been excellent that way. And again, with chili peppers, we, we, you know, when I first came here, both Texas and Arizona were kind of claiming they were the chili states. I said, no, no, no. 
It's going to be New Mexico. Fabian Garcia started it. We need to, you know, respect this man, his heritage, uh, and, and, and promote it. And so if, if I can have anything to do, it, we'll stay the center of the universe for chili peppers. And with that, I'll answer any questions you might have about chili peppers. Thank you very much. Joe. Is Don Yana County still a principal county, or have we lost it to? Uh... We have lost it to Luna, and, and um, that's because of house building. Every time a, a field is taken out of production and we build homes or something, it really will never come back. And so it's migrated now to Luna is the number one county. You know, the, the, the bigger um, constraint with our industry is offshore production. Um, that's why we've been working on a lot of different issues to try to be more competitive. Yield, of course, is, and disease resistance are important. But now we've looked at the machine harvesting. It's 95% of red chili is machine harvested now. And so um, the problem has been for us is green chili and cayennes. And this is green chili uh, can be picked by a machine, but it comes with the stem, and the processors need to get rid of the stem. We, we, they, pickers, when they pick it, they can, they've got their thumb going full speed, and they're popping off those calyxes like crazy. But when you pick with a machine, they come, and they, so we have to figure out a way to line up the chilies so we can cut off those stems. And this is one thing I still don't, I mean, I have to believe that this is correct, but they say if you, if you with the cayennes, we, we harvest them, we chop them up, add salt, and we let them ferment to make mash. That mash is then sent to make hot sauce. They say if you chop up a cayenne with a stem, it changes the flavor of the mash. They have to have the stems off. So we're trying to work on, on also getting the stems. And we actually had a, a fellow from Korea here uh, doing a uh, sabbatical, and in Korea, they pop them off by using like the old ringers on uh, washing machines, those wheels, and they run the chilies through that, and it kind of pops them off. And cayenne has a round enough calyx that it's uh, stem that it seemed like it might work. So it kind of worked okay, but we're really what they're looking for is, is a machine that can both do green and cayennes, because if someone builds a machine, they've got to sell it to a lot more people than just two processors in New Mexico. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your, uh, the rest of your breakfast, and thanks. <laughs>